Tell me, Van, what happened backstage? Were you able to see the canary? No luck, Charles. She's about as hard to get out in her dressing room as she is in that swing. idea of what I ran into back there. Let me point out a few of her admirers. outside her dressing room just now, along with these other two. Mm. I understand that the canary has her claws in all three of them. Are they rich? Mm. Naturally. Well, then what does she want with my son? The allowance I give Jimmy is highly tempting. Mm. Ah, my dear Charles, our little feathered friend in the swinger has social ambitions. She wants to be Mrs. Jimmy Spotswood. Ah, impossible. I'd do anything in my power to prevent that, even if Jimmy still cared for her. And I still believe that she'll listen to dollars and cents. Mm, I wouldn't be too sure of that, Charles. As you know, I've more or less made a hobby of crime and criminals. That girl is no ordinary blackmailer. Mm -hmm. I'm firmly convinced that she'll stop at nothing to marry Jimmy. But Jimmy won't have her. I tell you, he has really come to his senses. Another girl? Yes. Well, you know her. Alice. Oh, yes, of course. A very nice girl, too. Yes, she is. Vance, I'm afraid that I'll have to use my own judgment in this matter. I'm going to see this canary at her apartment as soon as possible. Well, very well, Charles. But, uh, act quickly. Oh, I know you'll smile, but... You know, I have a strange premonition that the canary is headed for disaster. Evening, Mr. Spotswood. Hello there. It, shall I announce you to Miss Odell? No, don't bother. That's perfectly all right. Yeah, very well. Jimmy! Alice. Jimmy, you were going to see the canary again. No, I wasn't, dear. In fact, I just started to put this note under the door to tell her so. Oh, Jimmy, I'm afraid of her. Oh, she's clever and cruel and unscrupulous. She'll hurt us again. I know she will. No, dear. She can't hurt us now. Hey, boy, will you announce my name? Uh, uh, never mind. Uh, yes, sir. Hello, Jimmy. Why, hello, Dad. Good evening, Alice. Good evening, Mr. Spotswood. You know, I'm delighted that you and Jimmy have made it up again. Oh, thank you. You know, I'm going to try to show you that all showgirls aren't like, well... Like the canary, eh? Yes. Yes, I want to talk to her. Do you suppose she's home yet? I suppose so. No, Dad, you, you're, you're, you're a regular guard for oh, helping me out this thing. You know, if, if the canary ever came between Alice me again, I don't know what I'd do. I don't know what I'd do. It's all right, Jimmy. I'll do everything I can. Shall I go along with you? No. I can handle this better alone. I'll send in my name now.
Box foot, call it. Send him in, please. Good evening, Sir Dell. Good evening. Shall we go over here? Why, yes. Will you sit down? Thank you. Well, I don't think we need waste any time, Miss Odell. You know why I am here. How much? Nothing doing, Mr. Spotswood. I've decided to marry Jimmy. I'm afraid that marriage is quite out of the question, Miss Odell. Oh, you're sure about that, are you? I'm positive. Well, how would you like me to tell the world about Jimmy's embezzling from your bank? What? You heard me. You know, Jimmy has a weakness for writing letters, and I have a weakness for using them. If Jimmy did write you a letter, you'll tear it up. Now, before I leave here. Sure. Go ahead, tear it up yourself. My memory's still perfect. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Yes. Very well. You win. Now, what do you really want? I've told you what I want. I want to be Mrs. James Spots, and that's that. Oh, haven't you any heart? Won't you give him up, Miss Odell? For the sake of his happiness, for the sake of the girl whom he really loves, give him up. Now, what do you want me to do? Burst out crying? Listen, Mr. Spotswood, I know all about Jimmy and Alice, and if he marries her, I'll tell every newspaper in this country that he's a dirty thief. Oh, no, you wouldn't dare do that. That's blackmail. Sure it is. Call it anything you like. But get this into your head that that's what I'm going to do. Well, that remains to be seen. Good night. Mr. Cleaver, please. This is Mr. Cleaver speaking. Now, see, Mr. Cleaver, the great reformer. Yeah. Well, this is your favorite weakness. Must. Don't get nervous, baby. I've got some news for you. Good news? Yes, darling, I'm going to marry young Spotswood. Well, well, well. May I send you my heartiest congratulations? You bet you can. But send them from Tiffany's. You heard me, and send me one of those fancy autographs of yours on a nice, fat check. I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid I shall have to refuse. Ah, be yourself. Big reformers who lead double lives can't refuse. I'll look here. I'll see you dead first. Listen. You'll be here after the theater with the dough and like it. A little rain. May I speak to Mr. Louis Mannix, please? Quiet, quiet, my wife. Don't get excited. I just thought you'd like to know I've sold the body down the river. I'm going to marry young Spotswood. <laughs> Splendid. Yes, darling. And I've decided that you're the best man. Best man? Yeah, the best man I know of to kick in with a nice, handsome present in cash. Oh, see here, you know I can't afford. What do you mean is? You can't afford to let the ball and chain know what a big-hearted Santa Claus you've been. Now, look here. I've told you what I'd do to you if you ever got to the wife. Forget that bunk. And be on my front porch after the show with that Jack, or I'll get to your wife all right. It's up to 
Lindquist speaking. Oh, yes, Dr. Lindquist. How would you like to do me a little favor? Why, certainly, Margaret. I'd do anything for you, you know. How would you like to go jump in the lake? Oh, Margaret, don't joke with me. I'm not in the mood for it. Ah, oh, get wise to yourself. I'm through with you. You give me the willies. I warn you, Margaret. I'm desperate. If I can't have you, no other man shall ever have you alive. In person, baby. How's my little squaw? I thought you were still in jail. Well, I got tired of the big house, Mrs. Skeel. So I dropped in to see my little wife. I'm not your wife. How come? I divorced you six months ago. Yeah? Listen, baby. A little thing like a divorce don't mean anything to me. I heard you taking those suckers down over the phone. And I'm in and in on the works. 50-50. You big crook, you're not in on this one. Don't, you big heel. <laughs> Say, I ought to bump you off. You're doing your swing for it. Yeah, uh, well, maybe it'd be worth it. I'll get this. I'm in on this racket. I'll be back. For my cut. Yeah, try and get it. Say, baby, don't bother changing the box on this door. The lock I can't pick is still in Yale. Miss Odell, may I see you for a few moments, please? It won't get you anything, but come ahead. Thank you. I have something to say to you, Miss Odell, which I believe will make you change your mind about Jimmy. Paper, mister? Morning paper? No. 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 Thanks, mister. Very well, Miss Odell. That suits me perfectly. Take it over tonight. 
and I'll come for your answer in the morning. Good night. Boy, would you call me a taxi, please? Yes, sir. What's that? The Bell! Miss O'Dell! What's wrong? Something startled me, Mr. Spotswood, but I'm all right now. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, quite sure. Run along home and come back in the morning. Oh, very well then. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Fellow, what big idea in you coming in here late? Who, me late? You, yes, you late. I've been here for an hour. Uh, I don't want that stuff. Well, I've been uh, here. I be beg your pardon. Mr. Spotswood, calling on Miss Odell by appointment. It, she don't answer. Has she gone out, do you think? I've been on all night. And you haven't seen her go out? No, sir. That's funny. Do you suppose she can be ill? But we may go and knock. Yes, yes, let's do that. <clears throat> Miss Odell. Miss Odell, are you ill? <laughs> no. What's the matter? Something has happened. Go get your pass key. Yes, yes. Say, fella, get, get running to get a cop. And say, get, get a, 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 a big one, too. You better let me have that. What's the matter here? Something's happening there, officer. You better take that key and go in. He's dead. Police headquarters, please. Norman Cassidy speaking. There's a woman dead at 184 West 71st Street. It looks like murder. Okay, Cassidy. She's been dead since midnight, Sergeant. Strangled to death. That long, eh? Sergeant, the district attorney just pulled up and he's coming right in. That's great. He's got that Mr. Philo Vance with him. Well, that'll be just dandy. Sherlock Holmes on the job again, huh? Heads up, boy. Good morning, Sergeant. Good morning, Mr. Markham. Well, hello, Mr. Vance. How are you, Sergeant? Fine. Haven't seen you since the Green murder case. Quite right. Oh, good morning, Mr. Spotswood. Good morning, Mr. Markham. Well, Sergeant, what does it look like? Well, Chief, it's just another clear case of robbery. All I can make out of it. Nasty business, Charles, huh? Oh, terrible. As you know, I was here last night to make my final appeal to her for Jimmy. And when I came back this morning for her answer, this has happened. Yes. They'll probably want to keep you here for a few moments, Charles. Yes, I suppose they will. And by the way, I explained to the district attorney on the way down about Jimmy and the girl here. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you did that, Philo. You know, if I can tell you anything that will help... Well, perhaps later, Charles. Meanwhile, I'll have a bit of a look about. I don't think there's anything worth you looking at, Mr. Vance. 
It's a clear case. Robbery. She put up a battle and they wrecked the joint. I see. As simple as that, eh? That's it. Well, just the same, Sergeant. If you don't mind, I think I'll have just one little look. Surely, Mr. Vance, go right ahead. Make yourself perfectly at home. Thank you, Sergeant. Excuse me, Mr. Leesman. When do we sleep? Now you get this, sonny boy. You'll go for a long sleep unless you button up that big trap of yours. Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, Chief. Any fingerprints? Well, so far, no. I'll tell you this job was done by an expert. It's perfect. Yes, that's just the trouble. What's that? It's too perfect. Well, that's a little over my head, Mr. Vance. Just what do you mean by too perfect? Well, Sergeant, what usually happens when a heavy lamp like that is knocked off a table? Well, I don't know, but I'll bite. What does happen? It usually smashes, doesn't it? It might. Well, look at that one. Well, what about it? It was simply that that lamp was placed there to give the effect of a struggle. Mm, maybe. Let me see, Sergeant. It does look a little obvious, doesn't it, Vance? I should say so. Hey, boy. What happened here last night after you heard Miss O'Dell scream and you and Mr. Spotswood ran down the hall to her door? Well, she said she was all right. And I called Mr. Spotswood a taxi cab. And you got away with it? Yes, sir. That's right. What time was this? It's on the call sheet that I gave you about... Never mind, I, I can read it. 12.10. Now, Mr. Spotswood, where did you go last evening after you left here? I went directly to the Stuyvesant Club. Oh, that's right, Sergeant. I met Mr. Spotswood at the club shortly after 12. We played poker until almost daylight, I believe, wasn't it? It must have been. I know it was long after four. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that coming down here, Vance. Right. Uh, that'll be all for the present, Mr. Spotswood. Thank you, Markham. But if you do want me later on, Mr. Vance has my number. Went right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye Charles. Charles. I'll phone you. Go right ahead, boys. Sergeant, would you step over here for a moment, please? All right, Mr. Vance, what is it now? Uh, do you observe anything peculiar here? Why, surely. The key is on the inside. Excellent, Sergeant. Don't you think we might go over that knob for fingerprints? Well, now, uh... Oh, I get you, Mr. Vance. The murderer locked himself in this closet. When Spotswood left, he came out and croaked the canary. No, I hardly think so, Sergeant. If you'll observe, this is the one place in the entire apartment that hasn't been disturbed. Now, what does that signify? That and the fact of the key being found on the inside. Just as I told you, the murderer was in this closet and came out when Spotswood left. Mm, I don't think you quite get my point, Sergeant. If the murderer had been in here, he would have upset this closet as he did the rest of the apartment, wouldn't he? Well, yes, I guess he would. Precisely. Gentlemen, it was someone else who was in that closet while the apartment was being ransacked. And that someone witnessed the murder through the keyhole. Splendid, Sergeant. And if you'll find who was in that closet, I think you'll learn from him, or her, who it was that killed the canary. Sergeant, get the fingerprints, will you? Oh, Joe. 
Oh, Sergeant, you might check up on the other apartments. Mr. Vance and I are going outside. You, come here. Yes, sir. Who lives in that apartment there? Miss Alice LaFosse. Isn't she the dame that had the battle with the canary the other night over young Spotswood? All right, all right. Possible to get in here. I'd say so. Hmm. Well, what's that? Hmm. That's odd. They prove that interesting. What do you think? I see, Miss LaFrance. I see. But you and the canary had a fight over young Spotswood, didn't you? Why, yes. We did have a fight. You see, she took Jimmy away from me and got him into trouble. But that's all over now. Jimmy and I made it up just day before yesterday. You didn't see young Spotswood last night, did you? Why, yes. He brought me home from the theater. Uh-huh. So he was hanging around here last night, was he? Yes, but he was with me until after one o'clock. Now, wait a minute, lady. Me. Wait a minute. You save your alibis till we get you down to headquarters. Go slip on your things. Why, look, you don't think that... Put them on. Mr. Vance, I'm frightened. Well, now, don't you be worried, Alice. Just you do as the sergeant says. All right. You know, I'm beginning to question this robbery theory, Mr. Vance. You and I were right. Hmm. Oh, yes. Why, I can see plainly that this murder is all mixed up in a love pact. You know, Chief, I think we'd better round up this young Spotswood and give him the work. What do you say? Quite right, Sergeant. Uh, Markham, I'd like you to add a few names to that list, if you don't mind. The men I mentioned on the way up here are Dr. Ambrose Lindquist, John Cleaver, and Louis Mannix. And young man, what do you know about what happened at the Canary's apartment last night? Nothing. But look here, sir. That has nothing to do with ours. Uh, I mean, Miss LaForce. The papers say the Canary was murdered before midnight. And I tell you, we were together the whole time. And it isn't fair to hold her. You haven't the right. Now, Jimmy, don't get worked up. Everything's going to be all right. Why not interview the others first, Markham? Very well. Gordon, take Mr. Spotswood out in the other room and hold him there. I'll talk to you a little later, young man. Bill. Well, who's next on the list? Mannix. I'd like to make a bit of an experiment, Martin. Have you a pad and pencil there? Yes. There you are. You have that newspaper handy? Yes, right here. Already? All right. Good morning, Mr. Vance. Good, Good morning. morning. Mr. Markham. Good morning. Can you please take a seat? Thank you. Sorry. 
Mr. Mannix, there are a few questions I'd like to ask you. Questions? What about? I don't know anything about this. It was a great shock to me. What was a great shock to you? Well, I, I thought perhaps you were going to ask me about the canary. <laughs> exactly. You read my thoughts, Mr. Mannix. Did you ever see that necklace before? Why, why yes. Fact is, I gave that to Canary. Little token of esteem. Nice girl, the Canary. I'd met her once or twice. <laughs> a casual acquaintance. Rather an expensive gift to give to a casual acquaintance, isn't it? Do you know that the Canary was strangled with that necklace? Most remarkable. Unfortunate, I should say. Where were you last night between 11 and 1 o'clock? Between 11 and 1? Yes. Let me see. Why, well, I was home. I went to bed about 10 o'clock. Uh, tired out. <laughs> you understand. Pardon me, Mr. Manning. Any comment to make, Mr. Mannix? Odd habit of mine, drawing triangles. Uh, Mr. Mannix, if you were in your bed last night at 10 o'clock, how do you manage to drop that newspaper just outside the Canary's apartment? Uh, that edition isn't on the streets until 11. Well, you've caught me. I'll tell the truth. It's always best to tell the truth, especially when there's no reason to lie. It was like this. The canary called my home at dinner time last night. Most embarrassing. <laughs> Mrs. Mannix was with me. I had omitted to tell my wife about the canary. She wouldn't have understood. <laughs> the canary told me that she was going to be married and wanted to see me. Said that I should come to her apartment at 11 o'clock. Well, I... <laughs> I couldn't argue over the phone. <laughs> the missus was listening. So I said, all right. So at 11 o'clock, I went to the Canary's apartment. I entered the hall by a side door. I went directly to her apartment. I was about to enter when I heard voices inside. I listened. There was a man in there. And he was arguing. Of course. <laughs> well... That was no place for me. So I returned home without seeing the canary or entering her apartment. Well, uh, that'll be all the questioning for the present, Mr. Mannix, but I'll have to ask you to wait in the outer office. I may want to speak to you later on. Oh, well, won't you let me go home? I'll get in an awful mess with my wife. I'm sorry, you'll have to wait. Oh, Mr. Markham, I wouldn't run away. Uh, Melfield. That'll be off. Mr. Markham, you gotta help me square this with my wife. We will now have uh, Mr. Cleaver. Good morning, Mr. Cleaver. Good morning, Mr. Markham. Can I do anything for you? Will you uh, please have a seat? Mind if I smoke a cigar? Oh, please do. Uh, Mr. Cleaver, do you mind if I ask you some questions? Why, of course, if I can be of any help. Where were you last night? between 11 and 1 o'clock. Motoring up the Hudson in the moonlight, alone. Though I don't see what that has to do with the district attorney's office. 
Well, only this, Mr. Cleaver. If you were indulging in the nocturnal beauties of nature along the Hudson last evening, uh, how does it happen that this cigar van, bearing your initials, was found just outside the Canary's window at an early hour this morning? Well, if I was passing the Canary's apartment, you can't twist that into a crime. Oh, then you did pass her apartment. Why, yes, I... I'm nothing to hide. It was about uh, dinner time last night. The canary phoned to me. Oh, of course, my, my acquaintance with her was wholly in my line as social reformer. I'd hoped that she was going to leave her immoral life and, and marry and settle down and be a good woman. And uh, you kept the appointment? Yes. Yes and no. I was a little late. I arrived at her apartment to about to a quarter to twelve or thereabouts. I waited for a minute outside her window to light a cigar. Then I uh, glanced down to the side entrance to the building. And who should I chance to see but Dr. Lindquist. He was behaving in a very peculiar manner. Seemed to me very queer, very mysterious. I didn't like it, so I made up my mind not to see the canary again. And I turned, walked back home. Well, I can tell you. I'm a busy man, and uh, I hope you'll excuse me. I'm very sorry, Mr. Cleaver, but I'll have to ask you to wait in the outer office. I might want to question you again. You mark my words, Mark. You'll be sorry for this. <laughs> well, I take my chances, Mr. Cleaver. Charming fellow, Cleaver. Yeah, rather. By the way, Vance, I didn't see you pick up this cigar band in front of McNary's apartment this morning. I didn't. Where did you get it? From your wastebasket. Wastebasket? Cleaver dropped it there when he entered. I took a chance on his not remembering that. It seemed to work. <laughs> well, I'll be... Hmm. Very good. Dr. Lindquist. Come on, Dunder. Take your hand. Hey, We caught Dr. Lindquist just as he was leaving town. It's a lie. I was on the way to a patient. Uh, won't you please sit down, Doctor? I'd like to ask you a few questions. Doctor, where were you last night between 11 and 1 o'clock? None of your business. It is some of my business. You were seen coming out of the Canary's apartment at midnight. Yeah, you Not so fast, Doctor. Calm yourself, Doctor. I'm sorry. I lost my temper. I'm under a terrible strain. I loved Canary dearly. And I'm terribly upset. Do you know that the Canary was strangled with that necklace? Me? Uh, Dr. Lindquist, there's really no need for you to be excited. Now, Mr. Markham here is merely trying to find out what you know. No. No. I know. I know. One moment, Doctor. Nothing. Markham, uh, don't you think that we might postpone the interview with Dr. Lindquist for a while? Why, what? Very well. That'll be all for the present, Doctor. I'd like to have you remain in the outer office. Come on.
Come on, Doctor. What was the idea, Vance? We had him where he was about to tell us everything. Well, on the contrary, Markham. In his present extremely excited condition, I very much doubt if he would have told us anything. I do think, however, that if we give him a chance to cool off a bit, he's very likely to tell us the truth. Well, perhaps you're right. Good morning, Sergeant. How are you, Sergeant? Good morning, Chief. Hello, Mr. Van. Take a slant at those. There is the canary's jewels. They were found in an ash can about a block from her apartment this morning. I guess that kind of disproves the robbery theory. We were right, Mr. Vance. Hmm? I say we were right. Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, apparently we were, Sergeant. Now it's up to us to find another motive. Yes, quite right, Sergeant. You know, Markham, I've been thinking this over all morning. And I believe that I can come pretty close to the psychology of the man who committed this murder. I believe that I can pick him out from that list of suspects, if he's among them. However, it will require a bit of an experiment. Now, what is in your mind? Well, I'd like to use that conference room of yours there for a friendly little game of poker with your suspects. Well, now, that's a cute idea. Well, just what is your idea, then? Well, just this, Markham. A man's true nature always comes out in a game of poker. Now, I know the type and the temperament of the man who murdered the canary. And in a game of poker, I believe that I can come pretty close to putting my finger on him. That's a new way of catching crooks. <laughs> hey, ladies, Sergeant, will you please? Well, go ahead, Vance. The experiment can do no harm. Quite right. Now, I'd like to have the sergeant's help. Well, I'd be very glad to help you, Mr. Vance. As long as you don't try to hang the murder on me. Uh, sergeant, will you take Mr. Vance's orders, please? Okay, Chief. Will you get me a deck of cards and have some poker chips handy just outside there? That's easy. Then bring in the suspects and impress upon them that they may be detained here for quite a while, possibly two or even three hours. Well, that's okay, Mr. Vance, but how are you going to get the suspects into this poker game without it appearing phony to them? Well, Sergeant, I rather think that the power of suggestion will take care of that. Oh, power of suggestion. Exactly. Now, Sergeant, look in from time to time. And when I pull my handkerchief from my pocket, so, break up the game by telling them that they're all free to go home. Understand? I get you. But when you release them, I'll have my boys tail them. Very good, sir. And Mr. Vance, here's to the power of suggestion. <laughs> Gentlemen, you're liable to be here for two or three hours. Perhaps longer. That's outrageous. Just make yourselves at home. Well, you know, this is going to get me in an awful mess with my wife. That is of no interest to me, sir. I'm sorry. What's the idea, Mr. Vance? Well, what are they going to do with Alice? Now, Jimmy, don't you worry. Nothing is going to happen to Alice. Say, Mr. Vance, you know, this is going to get me in an awful mess with my wife. Martha's a, my wife's a wonderful woman and all that, but sometimes she just doesn't understand me. The last time I was a little indiscreet, it cost me a fur coat. <laughs> I hate to think what this is going to cost. <laughs> but don't you think if you put... All right. Beg your pardon, I'm sorry. Mr. Vance, you haven't got an extra pack of cards, have you? I'm sorry, Mr. Mannix, but you're welcome to these. Oh, no, oh, no, no, thanks, just the same. <laughs> I, uh, I wish we could play a little cards. Say, that's a good idea. How about poker? I'm agreeable. What about the others? Uh, Dr. Lindquist? Oh, anything to pass the time. Mr. Cleaver? Well, uh, 
As a rule, it's against my principle. But I suppose on an occasion like this one, one can relax. Let us draw up chairs, gentlemen. Thank you. Sergeant, uh, how about some poker chips? Surely. Chief. Yes? Mr. Spotswood is here. Have him in. Come in, Mr. Spotswood. Good morning, Mr. Spotswood. Good morning, Markham. Good morning. I say, Markham, what are you holding Jimmy for? Surely you're not accusing him. No, no, of course not. We're simply trying to find out what he knows, that's all. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, where is he now? Why, in the other room there with Vance. May I see him? Why, certainly, of course you would. Vance, Mr. Spotswood is here. Oh. Hello, Dad. Oh, hello, Jimmy. Uh, good morning, Charles. Good morning, Philo. Dad, what are you doing here? I came to be with you, Jimmy, while you were detained. Oh, by all means. We've just started a little game of poker here, Charles. Would you like to join? Come on, Dad, sit and take a hand. Well, all right. I'll sit in. That'll be fine. Uh, suppose you take that chair, Charles. Thank you. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Spotswood. Mr. Mannix. And you, Mr. Mannix. Dr. Lindquist. Doctor. And Mr. Cleaver. Mr. Cleaver, how, how do you do? do? Shall it be jackpots, gentlemen? Why, yes, anything. Well, yes, the Mrs. and I usually play jackpots. Cards? Three, Mr. Vance, please. Thank you. Here you go. Two, please. So it's between you and me, Mr. Cleaver? Yeah. Hmm. I'll bet a white one. Oh, uh, so you're calling me? Yeah. Well, <laughs> just open this. Well, Jacks. Three aces. Oh. So you called a one-chip bet with three aces. <laughs> Open. I'm out. Passes. How many, Mr. Van? Two cards, please. Mr. Many? I think I'll play these. I'll check the bet to you, Mr. Manning. On a sure thing, uh, Mr. Mannix, huh? Yes, I open for one. I'll stay. Oh, let's make it a little more interesting. Ten more. Well, that lets me out. I'm out. And me. I'll stay with you, Charles. Cards, gentlemen. Three for me. One, two, three. 
Mr. Spotsman? I have plenty. Mm. <coughs> A white stack, Charles. Two white stacks. Hey. Two chips, Charles. Two. <laughs> oh, you want me to do the betting, eh? All right. I am afraid I am overcome by curiosity. What have you? <laughs> Two deuces. They're good. They're, they're what? Well, why the philanthropy, Philo? Well, I had case five. <laughs> Pardon me, Mr. Lance. Could I speak to you a moment? Excuse me, please. We've traced the fingerprints. Well, this is the bird that was in the closet that saw the canary murdered. Gentlemen, here is the man who was in the canary's clothes closet and who witnessed her murder. Hmm. Well, I shouldn't like to be the man he saw. <laughs> Thank goodness he didn't see me through the keyhole. So that man witnessed a murder. Singularly unattractive countenance. Well, if he knows, why doesn't he tell who did it? Gentlemen, I've uh, been instructed by the district attorney to inform you that you're all free to go home. Mm. Thank goodness for that. Mm. I wonder what the wife will say. Has anyone a fountain pen, please? There's, there's my. Oh, thank you, sir. Hmm? I didn't tell you about this bird, Mr. Vance, in front of the others, is that he phoned in and said that he'd be in the district attorney's office tomorrow and spill the whole works. He says that he saw the guy that croaked the canary. And he'll come in and tell us who it was. Now, we haven't been able to locate him yet, so I guess we just have to wait. Sergeant, that takes the matter out of my hands. there can be no doubt of it. The same person who strangled the canary that strangled Skeel. This new murder was done to cover up the threat. Skeel was obviously blackmailing the canary's murderer. He threatened to inform the police of what he had seen through the keyhole of the closet. And when the murderer learned yesterday at the poker game that the police knew who had been in the closet, he put Skeel out of the way at the earliest possible moment. 
I believe you're right, Vance. Oh, my. Did any of the suspects get away from your men last night? We never lost sight of Lindquist, Mannix, and the girl. But young Spotswood and uh, Cleaver gave us the slip. That'll be all. Okay, Chief. Vance, that leaves Jimmy and Cleaver. Morning, Chief. Good morning, Heath. Morning. Hello, Mr. Vance. Good morning, Sergeant. Well, Chief, everything's okay. I've got the guilty man, and I've got him right. You got him? I hope to tell you I have. Where is he? All right, Mac. Bring him in. Fence. Jimmy, this fool arrested me this morning at breakfast for the murder. Why, it's just like shooting fish in a tub, Chief. I've got all the dope and I've got it down pat. Motive and everything. Now this dame Alice croaked the canary. Jealous because she'd stolen her fellow. The kid here bumps heel off to shut his mouth and to protect the dame. A lot. That isn't all, Chief. I've got the evidence. And it's not psychology, Mr. Vance. Mr. Vance, he lies. He hasn't any evidence he couldn't have. Just a minute, Jimmy. Sergeant, what is your theory? Well, I don't go on theory. I use cold facts, Mr. Vance. Now, you wait a minute. Did you ever see that pen? Yes. It's mine. You bet your life it's yours. Take a look at that pen, Mr. Vance. Chief? Well? Now listen to this. This morning I found that pen on the floor there by the table where Skeel was murdered. And the kid here admits that it's his. Well, young man, what have you to say? Yes, I killed them. Both of them. I guess that does it, Chief. We've got them in a sack. Now, this dame out is... Wait a minute. You've got what you wanted. Now, take me out. Take him away, Max. Well, I'll see you later at the office, Chief. Sorry, Mr. Vance. Well, Vance, I guess that closed the case. No, Markham, it doesn't. What do you mean? I mean that the boy is not guilty. Well, that's nonsense. Not nonsense, Markham. Because I know who is guilty. Come now, Vance, Vance. I tell you, Markham, I know. And inside of one hour, You'll know, too. I'm going to telephone at once to the real murderer and have him come to the Canary's apartment. And I want you to be there. But the boy has confessed everything. Markham, if you don't meet me there, you'll be the laughing stock of New York in 24 hours because I'll have the confession of the real murderer. Well, all right, Vance, if you want it that way. I'll be there. Number three. Bayview 2121. Two, one. Bayview 2121. Two, one. Yes, please. Uh, this is Philo Vance. I want to speak with Miss. Oh, hello, Philo. How are you? I didn't recognize your voice. I have something of extreme importance to tell you. Jimmy has just been arrested. He has confessed to the murder of both the Canary and Skeel. Do you understand? Yes, I understand, Philo. Jimmy is not guilty. I am the man you want. 
How soon will you meet me at Canada's apartment? It'll take me almost an hour to get in from the country, but I'll be there. Good. It's been over an hour now, Vance. Don't be impatient, Markham. He'll be here. Who is it you're expecting? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. And I must admit that without his confession, I haven't a shred of real proof to offer you. Mr. Vance speaking. What? Yes. All right. What is it, Vance? Spotswood has just been killed in a motor accident. Spotswood killed? My sympathies, old man. I know what great friends you were. It's worse than you realize, Markham. It was Spotswood who killed both the Canary and Skeel. Spotswood? I've known it ever since the poker game. But how could you know? Sit down, Markham. It wasn't really so difficult. Remember, the man who committed this particular crime must have had certain definite qualities. A mind capable of working out a well-planned and brilliant course of action. Willing to take a desperate chance and see it through. Now consider the men in the game. Jimmy, I ruled out at the start. But I'd known him as a boy, and his youth and impulsiveness were hardly consistent with such a, such an obviously premeditated murder. Lindquist was far too excitable and erratic to have plotted such a carefully calculated crime. Cleaver, much too cautious and entirely lacking in the necessary boldness. Mannix, timid, and unwilling to take any risk except upon an absolutely sure thing. The only man at the table with enough imagination to plan such a crime and with sufficient self-confidence and daring to carry it through was Spotswood. When he held a pair of deuces, refused to draw to them, and bet every chip he had on the chance of bluffing me out, the realization suddenly dawned upon me that he was the murderer. For he was the one man of them all psychologically fitted for such an act. But uh, how about finding Jimmy's pen in the ski apartment? I borrowed Jimmy's fountain pen after the poker game. My hypothesis is that in the confusion, Spotswood put the pen into his own pocket and that Jimmy saw him do it. That is why Jimmy made his confession to shield his father. Yes, but against all that theory, Vance, we have certain definite facts. Now, for instance, Spotswood left the Canary's apartment while she was still alive. He talked to her through that door. The hall boy, looking through the keyhole, saw the Canary lying on this sofa smoking a cigarette. Spotswood then went away and spent the rest of the evening with you. True. And yet I know he committed the murder. Now I've got to find out how he did it. 
I'm afraid you will, Vance. So that Jimmy can go free. Spotswood himself was coming here to tell how it was done in order to free Jimmy. And now he's dead. I've got to solve it. I think I have the whole thing. Now follow me closely. The canary was lying there. Spotswood, let us say, was standing here making a final plea for his boy, which met with an absolute refusal. He walked around to the head of the sofa. Suddenly, he clapped his hand over her mouth and with his other hand caught her necklace. And before she had a chance to cry out, he strangled her. He then proceeded to set the stage to make it appear that the crime had been committed with robbery as a motive. He stripped her jewels from her and placed them in his pocket. Then, he took a cigarette from that box and lit it. He laid her hand here placed the cigarette between her fingers so that in case anyone should look through the keyhole of that door there, it would appear as if she were lying here smoking. He then overturned the entire apartment to make it look as if a burglar had ransacked the place. Now just step over here, Markham. He came to this closet door, but he couldn't open it. Skeel had locked himself in. So Spotswood didn't know that. And Skeel, through the keyhole, saw everything that Spotswood did. That accounts for the orderly condition of this one closet when everything else in the apartment was ransacked. 
And that, Markham, was the technique of the crime itself. But that doesn't account for the fact that... Now, just a minute. I haven't quite finished. I want you to go out into the hall and stand at the desk where Spotswood stood when he ordered his cab. Very well. the reason he returned here the next morning was to get it back. But he was prevented by the arrival of the officer who entered the apartment with him. The canary was dead when the scream issued from the apartment that night. She was dead when she apparently spoke to Spotswood through the door. But what clue led you to the photograph record? It was this magazine. It is hardly a magazine the canary would have read. So I concluded that someone else must have brought it here. Then in running through the pages, I happened to notice this. Look closely. You see it? Oh uh, yes, the, uh, the imprint of a large circle. And on the opposite page? And the same thing. Precisely. As if a disc had been pressed between the two pages. That brought to my mind the thought of a phonograph record. And suddenly, the whole plot became clear to me. It was the only way that Spotswood could have committed the murder and have produced a voice in the apartment after the canary's death. But I can't understand how it could, he could have reproduced the canary's voice. It wasn't the canary's voice, Markham. Spotswood made that record himself. Probably it was his own voice in falsetto. And remember, it was only necessary to fool the houseboy and for a closed door. Yes, I can see it all now. He played the game shrewdly and boldly. It was Jimmy's whole life's happiness that was at stake. And Spotswood risked his own life for his boy. Goodbye, Mr. Van. You'll never know how grateful we are. Goodbye, my dear. I wish you great happiness. Oh, thank you. Goodbye, Jimmy. Your happiness will come. Thank you, Mr. Vance. I... I can't say any more. Just now. Well, Mr. Vance? Well, Sergeant. I guess we put it over again. Right you are, Sergeant. Many thanks. Well, I'll be seeing you later. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sergeant.